Okay, so while we're getting settled, I wanted to start off by thanking our sponsors for all the pizza and beer and all of the amenities you've been enjoying. So, you know, obviously, very helpful. I'll step, I think it's the mics back there. Waxman PR, we actually have a couple people here today from. They are a big PR firm on Wall Street. There's been a lot of uh, big uh, Bitcoin and related companies. They've always they've been a really strong partner with us for a while, so we're very thankful for them and all the support they give us. Uh, obviously, Kick is, is here today as well, and we're very thankful for that. And, and you'll be hearing more about them very shortly. CoinSource, they have Bitcoin ATMs. I think there's like a three in the city right now, maybe a bit more. They're all over the world. It's a really fantastic way to get some Bitcoin. And of course, Dash, which has been very supportive of, of our community, and we're very thankful to them as well. I wanted to start off by introducing uh, Justin Hollow. Uh, Justin is uh, with this space, Digital Garage, and uh, he'll explain a little bit more about it. Justin. I first have some questions. Um, how many of you own crypto? How many of you do not own cryptocurrency? Raise your hand if you do not own cryptocurrency. Leo, do you own cryptocurrency? Okay, so that's like five people. Okay, that's fascinating. So you you are like increasingly rare. Maybe by the end of the night you will be like extinct. Um, how many of you own Curio cards? Okay. We could maybe we'll make that grow too. So, uh, so uh, let's get a round of applause for the people who organized this tonight. I suspect some of you might not get out of the house tonight if it wasn't for this. So good job, you guys. So this is Digital Garage 717, DG717. Digital Garage is a 23-year-old internet investment incubation company in Japan. Basically, they saw the giant internet coming and they said, we can make a better society out of this, let's experiment. And for 23 years, they've been experimenting. Their experiments were fruitful enough that they said, let's buy a building. And they bought this building. And then that's step one. Step three is profit. And I might be step two and so might you. So uh, we can uh, work together if you need a desk, a place to co-work. We host co-working desks, you know, floating or permanent seats. We have several companies that are in this crypto cryptographical space, cryptocurrency space. And uh, we also host events like you see here. Now, I will. I, I learned something a little, a little touching uh, from this event. We were Travis's second choice venue. He had booked another larger capacity venue, and they canceled at the last minute. And Travis said. DG717, I need some of your magic. Can you host us tonight? So, yes, we are very grateful. We, are, we hope there are not too many people at the door waiting for a piece of that kick pie that they won't be able to eat tonight, but, you know, they can watch the live stream on World Crypto Network. So, uh, without further ado, if you need anything from DG717, you can find us on the internet, and we're so glad you could be part of this uh, speculative future. Thank you. So I just want to go ahead and invite up Tom, uh, Tom is Hunt, he's of Mad Bitcoins, will be interviewing our speaker today, and he can go ahead and introduce him. Tom. Does it work? All right, thanks so much. I get my own microphone, and it works today. Oh, this is a much better start than last time, so today we're very excited to be joined by the CEO of KIT, Ted Livingston. Come on, Ted. Might have to switch it on and then talk directly into the top. Right. This is working. Okay, here we go. All right. So I just wanted to start with some background questions. When did you first hear about Bitcoin, and what did you do when you learned about Bitcoin? Uh, that is a good question. So I actually first learned about Bitcoin back in 2011, and that's that's pretty early for you still to be sitting here working a job. <laughs> Um, and when we first heard about Bitcoin at Kick, I think the thing that got us really excited, like back then, was we realized that for the first time ever you could use the blockchain to guarantee the scarcity of a digital asset. So you could have something, a digital asset, really easy to move around, but also scarcity, like a physical asset, like once you created it, there would never be more. 
That was uh, definitely one of my first ideas with Bitcoin is, oh, you're going to put your money on there, I'll make a copy of your money, and then I'll spend that. That's great for me. I can make as many copies as I want. So I never thought that. But it's not that. <laughs> and then it wouldn't work. It wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. They'd already be spent. So after you heard about Bitcoin, now just a little background on the KitKat. I did some reading today, and it's actually a pretty impressive history. It started out as a music player for the Blackberry, of all things. That's how old we are. <laughs> I'm sorry to let the word out there, but yeah, some of us carried Blackberries in the past, so it's not that foreign to us. We've had big fans of that keyboard. So I, I still maintain that a keyboard on the back side would be awesome. We call it the Blackberry Flip, but they don't, they're, not, they're not going for that. No, I think it's all just flat phones and they stack right up now. So yeah, they can stack evenly. Uh, but after you were a music app, uh, you then became a messaging app because you were upset that the BlackBerry messaging system wasn't a multi-platform system. Maybe one of their big failings. A lot of business people really loved the BBM system and they were shocked when they wouldn't bring it to iOS <coughs> and other platforms. So what did you guys do at Kick? Yeah, so when I started Kick, it was back in January 2009, uh, if you can believe that, eight and a half years ago. And I actually I went to the University of Waterloo, which is this college uh, right where BlackBerry started, I spent two years as an intern at BlackBerry. Um, and the cool thing is, we all got smartphones, me and all my friends, because they hired 2,000 interns every four months, believe it or not. Wow. Largest internship program in the world. Um, me and all my friends lived in this mobile first world before anybody else. And so I got really excited about that. I thought BlackBerry was the greatest thing ever. I was there when the iPhone was first announced uh, at BlackBerry. And I looked at my BlackBerry, I'm like, man, I love this device for so many things, but music just sucks. Like, why do I have to carry an iPod and a BlackBerry, but my other friends can carry just an iPhone, which at the, t at the time also really sucked. Um, the headphone jack was recessed. You had to get an adapter for the first one. It was a nightmare. Oh, yeah. And it was like, it wasn't even 3G. Like, no, like oh, the second one, the iPhone 3G. I'm like, why wouldn't we just make the first one 3G? They were in a hurry. It was a real hurry. They were in a hurry. But actually, so the first iPhone wasn't sold in Canada. It was only sold in the US on AT&T. I actually went to the U.S. to get one, and you have to like do this thing where you have to get a specific serial number. So I had to go through a few. I'm like, nope, I buy it, open it, wrong serial number, return it, pay the restocking fee, open the second. The second one, I got it, and I could unlock it. You had to have a special serial number to get it to work in Canada. Yeah, yeah, you have to get a specific one, then you can unlock. So it was basically, we looked at the iPhone, and we're like, hey, music is great there, and the phone is great. On BlackBerry, we think the, the, at the time the phone was great, but the music sucked. Like, let's build a better music app for BlackBerry. And the idea that, you know, today we call it like Spotify for BlackBerry, but back then we called it iTunes with free legal music sharing. Um, and it started on BlackBerry with this idea that, hey, wouldn't it be great if you get all, all this music on your phone, you could then take it to any computer, but you could also share it with your friends. And we were originally planning to do that through BlackBerry Messenger. Uh, but BlackBerry's like, you know, we're not going to take it to iPhone. And, you know, iPhone started to take off. We're like, well, well if you don't take it to iPhone, like, how are we going to do our chat thing? Because we're going to take our music app to iPhone. And they're like, well, you should just build chat yourself. And we did that. And then 2010, our chat app took off, went zero to a million users in wow. 15 days, million to two million users in seven days. Fastest growing thing in known human history at the time. Wow. My job was to like go get the, uh, the McDonald's <laughs> at 3 a.m. That's basically all I did. And sort of like, you know, give people like, Shoulder rubs, come on, we can do this, we can do this. It's like, keep those servers down, keep those servers down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. crashing, and they're back up. Like, come on, come on, we can do this. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where it all started. Well, that's amazing. And then uh, you heard about Bitcoin in 2011, and a few years later, you launched Kick Points. Uh, what was Kick Points about? Yeah, so the, the thing that got us excited about Bitcoin was it presented what we felt was like a fundamentally new business model. You know, before you build a consumer app and you, you know, get all these consumers to come to your app, and then you have one of two options. Option number one, you can sell their attention to advertisers, or option number two is you can try to sell them physical or virtual goods. And we realized that with like Bitcoin, the blockchain, there might be a third option, which is build an economy inside of Kick, get people providing value to each other, and facilitate that with a cryptocurrency such that if you have your own cryptocurrency, if the supply stayed the same, there's only ever going to be so much of them, but demand went up, then the price of the cryptocurrency would go up. And so if we could take some of that cryptocurrency in the beginning and set it aside for ourselves, we could fundamentally create a new way to monetize consumer app. 
Now it's not about showing people ads. Now it's not about selling them physical or virtual goods. Now it's about building an economy. Just trying to like bring people together and provide value to each other, and that alone is a way to make a lot of money. That was amazing to us. Now, this is back in 2011. People thought this was like a crazy idea. We didn't tell very many people. That's right. We didn't want them to think. I didn't want them to think. It was it's crazy. a secret. Yeah. Um, so we said, okay, could we could we actually build an economy inside of Messenger? And so we launched Kickpoints in 2014. And Kickpoints was not a, a cryptocurrency, but a digital currency inside of Kick. And the key thing about Kickpoints was there was no way to buy them. You know, you can't like you know use in a purchase or your credit card to buy some Kickpoints. The only way you could get them was by earning them. And so initially it started very simple. There was one way to earn them, watch ads. There was one way to spend them, which was uh, buy smileys. But on top of that, we felt, we tried to figure out if we could build this economy. So more and more ways to earn and more and more ways to spend. And by doing that, we created a transaction volume three times bigger than Bitcoin's global transaction volume at the time. Sometimes spiking up to like 10, 10 times plus. And so that's where we realized like, this just might work. But it was still a crazy idea. <laughs> it's like, wait, because Kick, you know, we raised like $120 million. Our last valuation was a billion dollars from Tencent. And so I knew that if I go to our investors, I'm like, hey, hey, guys, guys, new idea. And uh, we're not going to show ads. We're not going to sell stuff. We're going to launch an economy. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to love that. <laughs> that might not go over so well. Um, so it did take some time to get, to get the data to convince ourselves that this could work. And then it took some time to convince our investors. And the key thing that really helped with that is uh, one of our investors is Fred Wilson at Union Square Ventures. For those who know, you know, early investor in Coinbase, you know, been in the blockchain sector forever, uh, very long time. And he invested in Kick and joined the board of Kick uh, in early 2011. And so I didn't even tell Fred about this idea until 18 months ago. Because we were looking at the competitive pressure of these huge companies making it so difficult for companies like Kick to monetize, so difficult to compete, that I was like, okay, we need a different way to compete and we need a different way to monetize. Well, and, and so many of these companies start out with an open API, and then as they become more popular, they change the open API and everything goes away. You've seen all these apps for Twitter disappear, all these apps for Facebook disappear as they tighten the <coughs> ecosystem. So you guys wanted to do something different than that, right? What and advertisers advertising as a model forces them to do that. You know, they need to control the eyeballs, they need to control the inventory. So the idea of an open platform where other people are monetizing their eyeballs is like, well, we can't let people do that. that those aren't our eyeballs, that's our money. And so that's like what we loved about a cryptocurrency is it was, a, it was a new way to monetize. Now, it wasn't about controlling eyeballs. Now, it was just getting people, more and more people, earning and spending in more and more places in more and more ways. And the more we did that, the better it would be for users, the better it would be for developers, and the better it would be for us. So like, the coolest thing about it is like, we would become completely aligned with everybody in our ecosystem. We, like, users would be like, hey, the more places I can earn value, the better it is for me. The more places I can spend value, the better it is for me. Developers would say, hey, the more places I've earned spend, the kin that I have, cryptocurrency I have, becomes more valuable. And for Kick, you know, we we're setting in kin 30% aside for ourselves at the beginning. Hey, the more valuable this comes, the more it gets used, even if it's not even in Kick over time, even if there's competing messengers maybe one day, if those are places that you can earn and spend Kick, and more and more people are earning and spending in more and more ways, like the value's gonna go up, the value of our 30% is gonna go up, that'd be great. And so, for the first time ever, because we always loved the idea that you know, chat would become this big platform, but one day we could just open it all up and sort of walk away. Um, but now it allows you to create something that's both open and valuable in a way that was never possible before. So that sounds really amazing. People would be able to spend these tokens anywhere. They could go to other systems. And so you came up with the idea to make kin, which is named after kinship, like family, right? And you're going to have a new an actual coin this time, not the points where they were internal and maybe just a database. Yep. This will be an actual blockchain-based uh, coin. What's it going to be? Yeah, so it's going to be an ERC-20 token. And so the reason why, like we could have taken kick points and just put that on the blockchain. And right away it would become one of the most used, if not the most used cryptocurrency in the world. With millions and millions of mainstream consumers earning and spending in this cryptocurrency. 
But what we realized was, wait a second, if we do that, this cryptocurrency could be pretty valuable. And wait, what if we took a big chunk of that value and created basically an incentive mechanism for other developers to join us in building out a much bigger ecosystem beyond Kick? And that was like a critical insight because we, you know, Kick Points was inside Kick, that would be cool. But what would be even cooler is if any developer could join and the degree to which they got people earning and spending in the same cryptocurrency inside their app inside their community, they would share in the economic upside uh, along with us. Because you know you have all these different people who are trying to you know, build different apps, and they have a choice. They build their own cryptocurrency, or they could adopt our cryptocurrency. And we think to, to build an alternative ecosystem of digital services, it would be better if we could find a way to make it in everybody's best economic interest to all work together. And so that's why we called it KIN. Uh, and that's why we, we set 60% of all kin aside for the kin foundation, which will operate something we call the kin reward engine. And every day, this reward engine will give away a certain amount of kin all the developers in the ecosystem who help us grow it with us. And the coolest thing about it is, you know, the kin reward engine gives away kin every day. And so as the value of kin goes up, the value of this daily reward also goes up. Uh, you know, it's sort of like the blockchain, blockchain mining reward, but instead of for running the tech, it's for building the ecosystem of services. So, more developers means more places to earn and spend, means more demand for the currency, means more valuable currency, means a bigger daily reward, means more developers. And so, this is the exciting thing for us with Kin versus Kick Points is, yeah, we're going to put in Kick Kick and it will become super valuable on day one, we think. Um, but second is it becomes this tool to economically align a large group of developers to all work together towards a common goal. So it, so it sounds a lot like Steam, but instead of monetizing content, you're monetizing developers. So walk me through how it would work. If I was a developer and I wrote a chatbot, the users could donate kin to me or they could pay kin to use my chatbot? So this is the beautiful thing, okay? For at least I think it's what to do. So with a cryptocurrency, your goal is no longer to sell stuff. Your goal is to build an economy. Your goal is to facilitate value exchange between consumers. So consumers are coming together, they have value, maybe it's, you know, people host great live streams, maybe people host great group chats, maybe people great, give great fashion advice. You know, people have value to offer, and so all you're trying to do is bring those two people together and let them facilitate the exchange of that value between each other. And so that's a fundamentally new way for us to monetize inside of Kick. but that is also the way we want, what we want other developers in this ecosystem to do. Don't try to like build a bot or build an app to sell people stuff in Kin. you could, right? No, yeah, sure, like, you know, you sell hats for Kin. you can do that. But what would be cooler is if you build a community, an app around fashion advice, or around, you know, fantasy sports teams, or whatever it is, and all you are is you're just trying to bring people together and to exchange value through this cryptocurrency, and to the degree you're doing that, you're growing the overall economy for Kin, which is growing the value of Kin, and the degree to which you grow the value, we will give you that value back through the reward engine. So the, the rewards would actually come from the Kin Foundation, not so much from the users or from the developers. Yeah, that's, that's why you know, we're not doing Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of those is because you know, we don't own 60% of Bitcoin, so we can't give away 60% of Bitcoin. But off the bat, you know, by creating KIN, we can set the initial application, and so we can say 60% you know, of all KIN is going to go to developers. Well, this sounds great. Where can people learn more about this? When's the uh, ICO happening? Sound like a dad. So uh, learn more. <laughs> No, I don't want to sell you. What do you be critical with me? What do, what do you think? My, my main critical thing would just be why not use Bitcoin? But I think you pretty much handled that at the 60%. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a with the foundation idea. I think that sounds solid. Um, what about the? I, I've read that you're going to use Ethereum as a settlement layer. How's that going to work? So yeah, it's going to be an ERC20 token, um, and that is one of the challenges of this project is the scalability of the Ethereum network, and, and frankly, at this point, the stability of the Ethereum network. Um, you know, we're starting there, a lot of the tools are built around that, and it makes it really easy to get started. And to scale it initially, we are going to go on-chain, off-chain. So we'll do 
you know, we'll, we'll write back the transactions to the Ethereum blockchain, but we'll do most of the transactions in our own ledger, similar to Kip points. And this is not ideal. Like, we don't want to do this. Um, but for example, we'll probably let you do microtransactions. Let's just do microtransactions, all this. Transactions, all this. Um, but it, but it and, the and the reason we have to, so like one of our investors did a calculation. Like, if we just wanted to give five kin to each of our users for free, just as a starting point, it would take up the entire capacity of the entire Ethereum network for 23 days. Wow. No transacting, wow. no earning, no spending, just, hey, buy for everybody. And it's like, boom, it's down, it's not coming back. Um, so, that doesn't sound good for the price. Yeah. Well, so in the, in the short term, you know, we have to take a lot of these transactions off chain, but in the long term, you know, we're really looking for what we call blockchain 3.0. We look at Bitcoin as blockchain 1.0. For the first time ever, you can guarantee scarcity of a digital asset. We look at Ethereum as blockchain 2.0. For the first time ever, you can add logic to that. And now we're really looking for blockchain 3.0. You can have those two, two things plus scale. And that may be Ethereum, you know, for Casp or for stake. That might be a new blockchain that we partner with, or we actually might take a crack at building our own blockchain. Uh, but this is. I think, you know, I, I feel like this is the internet, but we're like dial-up modem stage. Like we need like cable modems here, DSL or something. Um, so we're gonna spend a lot of time on that as well. Sounds interesting. Do we have any questions from the audience? So we have a microphone, Travis, where do you yeah, go? I got a microphone here. All right. And I'll come to you. Uh, let's start right here. Don't worry, the audience questions are always very, very hard. No, I don't like our questions actually. Although we'll see, maybe, I don't know, you gotta, you gotta look at your face like you're gonna kill you. <laughs> so, what sort of control over the kinds of goods and or services that are gonna be exchanged will the platform be able to exercise? So will it be a sort of complete decentralized marketplace or are we gonna see some sort of tracking of sort of who's selling what? So, this is a question we think a lot about, which is like, on one side, we want this to be a positive thing for society, but on the other side, we want there to be as much freedom as possible. And actually, this is something we've dealt a lot just within Kick itself. Like, the reason people really like Kick is it's a community, it's a place to come hang out with your friends and make new friends. So we deal with the same thing. At the end of the day, this will be a cryptocurrency, which means once you have it, you control it, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, but inside Kick, we are definitely gonna regulate how it gets used make sure it's only used for safe and productive things. You know, I think there's a lot of dark things you can use this stuff for, and we don't want that to be inside Kick. So we'll be able to completely regulate how this gets used inside of Kick. Outside of Kick, but inside of the Kid ecosystem, we will be able to strongly encourage safe and productive behavior by saying, hey, if you want some of this daily reward pay in shed, these are the acceptable types of services. And so you can build whatever you want, but if it's you know one of these blacklisted types of services, there's no economic incentive for you to do so. Um, so I think between those two things, inside Kick, explicit control, outside of Kick, but within the overall ecosystem, sort of implicit control, we'll be able to build something that's, I think, like you know, positive and productive for society, which is definitely the goal. Um, can you talk a bit more about what's, what what the ecosystem is going to look like after the sixty percent of the coins that you guys keep is going? Uh, it's going to kind of end. Would you assume that? Like, how 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 would you incentivize developers to continue building uh, software on your ecosystem? So the way the sixty percent will get distributed is it will get paid out twenty percent per year on a declining basis. So the first year, twenty percent of whatever is left, so twenty percent of sixty percent, twelve percent gets paid. Out. Then you know now there's only forty eight percent left, so twenty percent of that, 9.6 percent gets paid out. So it, there will always be something getting paid out, less and less, hopefully at higher and higher prices. Um, but I think that, like at the end of the day, so what, what that means is there will be value paid out for a very long time. But at some point it will get small enough to be negligible, you know, maybe 10, 20 years in the future. Um, at that point, the answer is we don't know. But I think where we will be at that point is we'll have this new global microtransaction financial system. And the cool thing about it is, no matter what country you're in, and no matter how much value you are providing to the ecosystem as a consumer, you can get compensated for that. So if like Billy in India hosts a great group chat, 
such that he created one penny of financial value to this ecosystem. You know, today we're like, okay, Billy in India, get his address, we'll write him a check for one penny, we'll mail it to him. It's like, that's never gonna work. But now with a cryptocurrency, we can actually do that. And I think that's the ultimate goal for this project, is to create a financial system where no matter where you are, no matter how much value you provide, you can get compensated for that. Um, and so at that point, you know, we'll see what happens on the developer side, but we think there's a lot of money to be made between today and that point. Can you share a little bit about your user demographics, um, sort of age, gender, and, and geographic location? Um, with Like with a lot of this stuff, my first thing is to check with my 14-year-old son and validate whether this has wheels or not. And he was unfamiliar. So, I, you know, it's data point of one, so it's not a fair question, but... Yeah, so uh, Kick is, we have 15 million monthly active users. Um, you know, if you guys go to the App Store, we're in like top 100 free apps. Um, the majority of our users are in the US. The reason it's popular on Kick is it is a chat community. So it's not like a chat utility where, hey, where are you? Or a place with press mass. It's a place like, come hang out with your friends and make new friends. Because the username base, you have complete control of your identity on Kick versus you know, having to give out your phone number or your social profile. Um, so what it means is it's like great for connecting across communities. You probably have read on the internet, hey, what's your kick? And you're like, I don't know, what's, what, what is this kick? Um, that they're referring to the messenger. And uh, kick is, there's just a study really says the number five most searched for term uh, in the app store overall. Um, which I thought was pretty cool. So yeah, we, we skew younger, roughly equal male, female. We also skew less affluent, more urban. So Ted, appreciate your, your talk. Help, help me out specifically with the kinds of use cases that you really think this is gonna develop, that the use cases will develop. I mean, is this essentially gonna be like Venmo within your app, or is there actually gonna be a marketplace that develops where people will use Kin as the currency within that marketplace? or set of marketplaces? Yeah, we don't think of this as a competitor to Venmo. Like we think for the physical world, physical currencies work really well. Um, and we think virtual currencies work really poorly for the physical world, you know. I get my paycheck in US dollars, I convert to Bitcoin, I buy a burrito, they convert it back to US dollars to pay their employees. And in the meantime, you know, the volatility is one like this, and so not only have I wasted a bunch of time converting my money back and forth, but I've also like taken a bunch of risks. Um, so we don't we don't do this. Like we think physical currencies work great for that, Venmo, you know, Visa, all that stuff. Uh, where we think this provides a unique role is in uh, virtual communities for virtual value. So you know, creating a great sticker, buying a great sticker, hosting a great group chat, joining a great group chat, you know, doing a great live stream, joining a great live stream, building a great level in the game. Playing great level, whatever that is, and that's like the really cool thing for us, you know, skewing younger, skewing less affluent. And what we heard from our users with kick points is like, you know, now for the first time ever, I can provide that, like I can get compensated for the value I provide to my phone. Basically, we gave millions of people their first job, and so we think that's really cool. Like all these people in a, a society and economy where it's getting harder to do jobs and wealth is more centralized and all this stuff, and we actually get a place that you can earn value and provide value to society and to the ecosystem. Um, but we think they'll all start through digital goods where everything is denominated in this virtual cryptocurrency. Yeah, hi. Um, so this sounds like a really interesting concept to couple cryptocurrency with the uh, chat client. Oh, okay. hi. Hey. Um, it's, it's been done before with something called gems or get gems. And I'm wondering if you're aware of it and uh, it started off fairly promising. They had a they had a coin. It eventually got delisted. It was funded to some extent, and then it got I think folded into Telegram or something. So I'm wondering if you're aware of it, and are there any takeaways from that? Any lessons learned, or how how would you approach it a little differently? I know that your kick points idea is kind of a proof of concept ahead of the cryptocurrency integration, which could be a big part of that. But if you can comment on that a little bit. 
Yeah, so we actually know those guys decently well. Uh, we do have an office, one of our offices in Tel Aviv, uh, where I think that project was based. So we actually do know those guys pretty well and have worked with them uh, to some degree as well. I think the difference with GetGems is they were trying to use a cryptocurrency to create a financial incentive to grow the user base. So hey, like in all this like, hey, get your friends to join and then you get some cryptocurrency and then they join and they tell their friends to join and they get some cryptocurrency. And like this would be the reason people would come get, get gems. Um, that's like not our plan with Kit and with Kit. Um, we think at the end of the day, the idea that you can get compensated for the value you bring to the network is interesting, but it isn't why you would join. You, know, you would join because you want these kids, you want to join the chat community, you, know, you want to control your identity, and so we already have millions and millions of people that use Kit. Um, we think the biggest value of this to the consumer at the end of the day is not so much that they can get compensated for the value they bring, even though that is cool, like we do like that, but it's more that we can provide a monetization model for developers. Because I think, you know, with the centralization of these digital services to a few big companies and a few big bland services, you know, we're seeing less and less innovation in the mobile space. I mean, when's the last time you discovered a cool new app? You know, it's like, you're like, I don't know, Snapchat in like 2012? Like, um, and the reason for that is these big companies have made it very difficult to find a sustainable business model. You know, only they have the, the scale to effectively monetize through advertising. So they do that, and then they give everything else away for free. So as an independent developer, you're saying, so I don't have your skill to do ads, and you've taught everybody that everything should be free, so I can't sell anything. So how, how do I make money? You can, you're like, go work at Facebook. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, like, and so it's leading to this future where we believe like, there's gonna be less and less innovation, less and less choice, and it's gonna get us to this future where a few big companies control all the digital services and there'll be very few of them. And we think that less innovation will just be shitty for consumers. We think there should be a bunch of different services for every individual interest, every individual niche. Like no matter what you're interested in, you can, you can find an app and developer who's catering their digital service just for you. But the only way that that can happen is if those developers can make a living. And so I think that's like the thing we're trying to do with Kin is, hey, all you developers out there, we're not gonna be able to take on these big companies directly, right? They have just too much money, too many developers, they, they know what they're doing, they're very smart people. But in each individual niche, in each individual interest, each of us could build a better digital service for that specific interest and that specific niche than these big companies could provide with their big bland service that's trying to serve everyone. If only there was a way to make a living in doing so. And so that's really what the Kindle Awards Center is trying to do is like bring together thousands and at some point tens of thousands of developers to build that new and alternative ecosystem of digital services, an ecosystem that consumers own their identity, own their data, and can easily and frictionlessly, but also securely move between all these digital services where developers get an open, fair, and lucrative platform to build on. All right, I have two questions for you, actually. First of all, you said that uh, cryptocurrencies were the first digit, scarce digital asset, but Amazon credits existed before cryptocurrencies, and isn't there a finite amount of Amazon credit? And for that matter, uh, all bank balances, as well as, for that matter, Warcraft gold? I really honestly like, nope. <laughs> Um, so, what, what I said is, a cryptocurrency, for the first time ever, can guarantee the scarcity of a digital asset. Um, you know, we ran kick points. Are there only so many kick points? No, we can create more whenever we want. And you're just going to have to trust us that we don't create too many. Um, and so I think, you know, you'll get Amazon credits. They create, they create more all the time. Do you think they have like an internal ledger? They're like, we're running low on the Amazon credits. <laughs> what will we do? But will you have an internal ledger for Kin to decide how much Kin is created? So that's, so that's the beautiful thing with the blockchain. Like we know with Bitcoin, for example, there's only going to be ever be 22 million Bitcoin or whatever it is. 21 million. 21 million. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sorry, I was not on something. Um, and but, so that's the beautiful thing. Is like as a developer, as anybody in the ecosystem, you can look at Bitcoin, you can say, so there's only going to ever be 21 million Bitcoins. So 
So the supply is fixed. So if the demand for Bitcoin goes up, economics 101, supply stays the same, demand goes up, price is gonna go up. And therefore, if I buy some today, if I think the demand is low, because I think tomorrow the demand will be higher, I will be able to sell at a higher price. And that's the thing that was just never possible. Amazon credits, is the demand guaranteed to be the same? No, they'll make more whenever they want. But nobody expects the value of Amazon credits to go up. Everybody expects the value of Amazon credits to always be pegged one to one with the dollar. Right. Yeah, I think it's like different. Like I think Amazon credits is like a different way to use US dollars where this is like a fundamentally different financial system. All right, that's all going good. My second question for you is uh, what will Kick do in order to guarantee the value of Kin going forwards? So we cannot guarantee the value of Kin. You know, I think once you create a cryptocurrency, it sits on exchanges and the price of it is set by the market based on supply and demand. And so, you know, even though supply is fixed, if demand goes down, the price is going to go down. But I think what we can guarantee is we are all in on this. You know, this is something we've been working to towards for a long time. But this is something that is in our financial best interest because of the 30%. But actually, like, just to be honest, like, this is something we have to do. We cannot compete with Facebook. We can't, everything we do, they copy it two years later. Um, they have way more developers, way more scale. And that, that was, for us, was really the turning point is when we saw Snapchat's S1. And we looked at it and we're like, wait, even Snapchat is struggling? Like, this company has raised $2.5 billion. They have 2,000 employees. They had an amazing insight, amazing brand. They've done everything perfectly. And even they are struggling to compete with Facebook. So there's nothing backing the Kin token? The only thing backing any cryptocurrency is demand. Like, you know, why is Bitcoin worth what it's worth? Why is it Ether worth what it's worth? It's because there's a fixed supply and there is so much demand. If demand goes down, then the price will go down. If demand and goes up, the price will go down. And what will be fixing the supply of Kin? Sorry? And what will be fixing the supply of Kin? The blockchain. Hi, Ted. Thanks for your time. Uh, curious about a couple of things. A, what is the tax treatment of the ICO? And B, given the level of funding, what does the ICO mean for your equity investors? So on the tax side, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. You know, I, I know like, this space is like evolving so quickly. Um, you know, our lawyers, our tax people, all these people are like, we're doing what? Um, so I, I'm, not gonna give, I'm not gonna give tax advice, so I won't do that. Um, but in terms of like funding, you know, we have raised $120 million uh, from traditional investors, and the most recent investment we took was from Tencent. Um, you know, one of the most advanced messengers in the world. They invested $50 million for 5% of the company. Um, those guys want to return. You know, we invested all this money, so you're just going to give this all away? And so I think this is what is cool about cryptocurrencies is we say, no, 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 we're not. Yes, we want to give it all away. We want to open everything up. We want to give up control and build this open, decentralized ecosystem. But in doing so, we give Kim a better shot at succeeding and by setting 30% aside for ourselves, like, you know, if Kin were as popular as Ether is today, that 30% would be worth $9 billion. That'd be pretty awesome. You know, we'd give some back to you guys. You know, you invest 50 million, maybe we'll give you 500 million out of that $9 billion. And so that's why it took some time, it took some time, but you know, he said, listen, we need a new way to compete. We need a new way to monetize. This is the best way and we can make some money too if it works. And so, you know, it did take some time, and I gotta give credit, like, Fred Wilson, if we didn't have him as our investor, this never would happen. Um, you know, I told him about it 18 months ago, he said, that's crazy, but like, let's think about it. And then six months ago, he said, he sent me this email, I'm gonna and send it to him. He's like, it's time, you know, it's time. And I was like, yes! <laughs> because it was like, this is what we've wanted to do since 2011, it was this crazy idea, and I knew that if, we could get Fred on board, we can convince the company, and we can convince the investors that this could work. But without Fred, we never would, because he's the cryptocurrency guy. And so that was really, you know, that was back in January. Um, you know, it's funny, like even back in January, like these ICOs were like not a thing, and today everyone's like, well, your timing is perfect. It's like, we didn't plan that. <laughs> like, like um, but I think like that's the exciting thing is like, 
we get to go for it, yeah. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. Thank you very much. Incredible talk. Um, I actually had a question regarding spending kick tokens. So, um, kin tokens, sorry. So, essentially, um, one of the main problems with spending cryptocurrency right now, like if I want to buy some gummy bear or something at the convenience store, is that I know if I hold on to it, um, it's going to go up in price. So, the guy who bought like a pizza five years ago is now really regretting it. <laughs> if you predict that the kin token is going to up. Yeah, exactly. Like, nobody wants to spend it. Oh, yeah. Um, if you predict that the kin token is going to go up in price, um, essentially because of the rising demand, what incentive is there for developers to like give out those tokens or like um, spend tokens in the ecosystem just because you know holding on to it is a better use case? So this is obviously like a new space and it's emerging, but I think our answer to that is our, our sort of like insight was you know with Bitcoin when people are buying it like and you know it's going up, it's super volatile. First of all, why would you buy it? And second of all, why, why would you spend it? Um, this is why Kick Point said the only way to get it is to earn it. You can't buy it. Can't buy it. The only way to use it is to spend it. You know, you can't sell it. Okay? And that was with Kick Points, not with Kin. Kin will be on the exchange because you'll be able to do all those things. But the reason we felt that that was important is as a consumer, if everything you're earning and everything you're spending are denominated in a specific currency, then you don't really care what the exchange rate is, or to a much lesser degree. So for example, does anybody in this room know what the exchange rate is between US dollars and Italian dollars? No, nobody cares, because they're like, well, I don't do anything in Italian dollars. So we think like for developers and for investors, yes, they will care. You know, maybe developers, the kin they get from the reward engine, they will hold on to them. And actually, that's one of the things, is like you can become a stakeholder, you can share in the economic upside of the creation of this ecosystem. But for consumers, you know, th these are just a bunch of marketplaces. People are, you know, listing their stickers at a certain price and then buying them at a certain price, and listing their group chats at a certain price and buying them at a certain price. And so the market will determine how valuable this is. And so it will sort of get up and down, but it will all be within that economy. And so the exchange rate becomes much less important and volatility becomes much less impactful. Um, thanks. Uh, I uh, really like what you're saying about open systems, decentralized systems. Uh, I think it's a great step forward moving to Kin as like a, this decentralized currency. But as far as I understand, Kick is still a, a centralized messaging platform. So as a developer, I'm just kind of wondering like, what guarantees do I have? Will stuff be shut down? Do, do you have any plans to, to open that up uh, to make it a more decentralized platform? Or if not, like, how do you feel about the, the other messaging apps that are kind of decentralized that are coming up? So we, we have said that we are going to open source kick. Uh, so the client code, the server code, you'll be able to see that. But I think at the end of the day, we're trying to do what matters to consumers and what matters to developers. Consumers do not care, for the most part, that open and decentralized. They just don't. You know? And that's why we have these huge centralized entities. Like, you know, we say, but they're taking all your data. And they're like, I don't care, man. My mom posts here. I, I, you know, that's, that's where I go. Um, and so for us, like, this open and decentralized is not about consumers. Uh, you know, even though it is in the long term, we're like, oh, but one day society will have less innovation, less choice, and less freedom, and they'll control the whole thing. And like, yeah, but for now, it's pretty good. So th this, this, this is about developers and about how can we build an ecosystem for developers that developers can trust and developers can make a lot of money. If I trust, trust no one, uh, ultimately, at the end of the day. And so that's why, yes, Kick is a centralized app run by a centralized company. But we are using Kick to bootstrap the value of Kin, and then we're giving a bunch of that Kin to this independent, not-for-profit foundation, the Kin Foundation, okay? Now, we are gonna have a lot of influence over that Kin Foundation, at least initially. Right, we're not going to sit there and be like, no, oh, no, no, it's totally independent. Like, obviously, it's like, you know, Kit created Kin, Kit, Kin created the Kin Foundation, you know, they put Ted on the board because, you know, we thought he was really smart or whatever. Like, obviously, we're going to have influence there. But our goal is to, yes, we're going to start with influence to try to get this whole thing running. But there are two, two things. Well, really, one thing is, it's what is in our economic interest over time? And what is in our economic interest over time? is for this token to be used in as many places as possible. And so what we are going to do with the Kin Foundation is move to decentralize it and to make it completely autonomous 
as quickly as we can. Not right away, because right we don't want the Dow all over again. We're like, we thought it was right, but it wasn't, and you know, the whole thing blew up. Too bad it's completely autonomous and decentralized. So it's going to start as centralized and not autonomous, in, as independent as we could possibly make the pledge that we could. So over time, we'll move it to be, okay, it works, the reward engine's working, it's not gameable, everything is running, and it's working, nobody's hacked it yet, or it's, it's not being hacked, everybody agrees, like, okay, now is the time to make it fully autonomous, fully decentralized, and we'll do that. So decentralized identity system, decentralized transaction system, and a decentralized uh, reward engine. And those being the three key pieces. For a user, you hold those three, and then you can move between any of these digital services, such that one day, like, you know, it would be so awesome, and they're like, yeah, this Kin thing, it started in one service, I can't remember which one it was, and everyone's like, yeah, I don't know. And it's like, you know, Kick has just sort of been forgotten. It's just like, it, it, is an, it is hopefully an important player. We think it is important to have like a strong anchor tenant in this ecosystem, at least for the foreseeable future. So we do think Kick is very important to that in the short to medium term. But over time, we're trying to create this like new open ecosystem where any developer can come in, innovate, as a consumer, you can move between any of them, try them right away, easily bring your identity with you, start earning and spending in a frictionless but secure way wherever you go. Um, so that's, that for us would be awesome. And if at the end of the day, Kim's like accepted everywhere and we own 30% of it, but fuck, that would be cool. Um, so that's what we're gonna try to do. Cool, so um, I have a question and then I wanna challenge a cryptographic or a cryptocurrency concept that we kind of talk about. So one, um, what digital services do you envision users are gonna exchange most, like top three? Because you talked about developers adding value. What value are the users using or providing? So we think about things that, especially like young people, teens can do from their phones and what, what sort of skills and value they have. So, you know, we think creating great like expressive content will be a good one. We think hosting great places to hang out will be a great one. Um, and we think creating great experiences that you can go and get with your friends. So, you know, stickers, group chats, live streams, games, all of those things. Um, but over time, I mean, you know, something about Kick is, we have, we have this like history of innovation. We were the first chat app to go viral in 2010. Uh, first chat app to become a platform in 2011. First chat app to, in the Western world, to launch bots in 2014. We have been the first like over and over and over again. And this is why Tencent invested in us. So like, we see what's happening in chat, and you know, we think it's either you guys or Facebook in the West. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I do love the idea. So if you had more, please. So, so I was just gonna say, so with our bot platform, which is our most recent iteration, like first it was native apps, then it was web apps, now it's bots. I could talk about bots forever, but that's a story for another day. But we've had over 100,000 bots built on the Kick platform. Um, so I think that's, we don't just have a lot of consumers and a lot of experience building for consumers, um, but we also have a lot of experience with developers and building platforms for developers. And so I think that's really where we hope a lot of the innovation comes from is, as a developer, you know, you don't have to spend all this time building a native app that nobody's gonna download. You don't have to try to learn how to build a web app, which nobody really knows how to build. But you can build a bot, it's really quick to build, really easy to grow, and that can become the sort of testing ground for all these different ideas. You can get users right away, because we're gonna promote the, the heck out of all these bots. But then once you have something, you can tell those bots, hey, we built an app, you should go get it. And so that's where you no longer have to trust Kick, transition all your users to your own app, your own property, where you're gonna complete control. Um, so we think a lot of the innovation will come from the ecosystem, hopefully. So it sounds like a lot of the services that are provided by the users are similar to Steemit, and that's your question, Tom. It, it sounds like it's pretty similar to it. I do like the concept of users providing content and um, creating groups and getting people onto the platform and then them being paid out as a result. But you're adding groups and like, like the messenger perspective of what Steemit would, Steam would be. Yeah, I think there's some similarities. I think there's some differences. And then the challenge I want to kind of throw out there, because you used the example of everyone is using the Kin um, currency to transact, and if they're all in the Kin currency, it doesn't matter what the exchange value is. If we have a ton of currencies doing different things, like how they interact is going to be really interesting, because I foresee a future where people hold on to currencies because they do see the value going up, but then move on to a different currency and just fluctuations all over the world because, and all over the different currencies because there are so many of them. 
how can there be stability? Well, I think, so there's going to be a bunch of different cryptocurrencies because there's a bunch of different types of economies you can build. You can build an economy around computing power, around file storage, around you know, stock trading algorithms, around communities. Uh, so I think there will be a bunch of uh, cryptocurrencies, a bunch of economies. And that's like the fundamentally new and exciting thing. You're not building an app, you're building an economy. But I think for Kik, with Kin, what we're trying to say is like, okay, if you're building a consumer application, so you're not building something for traders, you're not building something for people on call or whatever, you're just building something like where consumers can go to hang out. How can we set up Kin such that if the roles were reversed and somebody was approaching us, say, hey, we know you're thinking of building your own cryptocurrency, but we've set up this other cryptocurrency, and if we partner, not only do we think it will be a better way to compete as two versus two together versus two separately, but also it will be very simply be in your best economic interest. And so that's really what we're trying to create with the Kin Reward Engine is, hey, you're building a consumer service, yeah, you can go build your own cryptocurrency, for sure. But if you adopt ours, we just think you'll make more money. And that the entire ecosystem overall will become stronger. So it's like, you win, you make more money, we win, you know, we have that 30%, but then we both win because we can both ride the upside of it. Will uh, these be considered securities under U.S. federal law? <laughs> Turn the cameras on. That's going to haunt me one day. I hope not. Ooh, I'm not really picturing it. Um, so we spent a lot of time on this. Like, obviously, we don't think, don't want this to be viewed as a currency, or as a security. Um, so obviously part of that is like, you know, it's utility and making sure there's utility, which there will be, you know, that's what we've shown with big points is there's huge utility for this. I don't think that's a question. But I, I also just like sort of fundamentally philosophically don't think this is a security. You know, security is you own a piece of a revenue generating entity. Like, you know, you, you get, you know, future dividends is where it came from and, and et cetera. Whereas here it's like, you just literally own an asset. And if demand for that asset goes to zero, then the value of that portion of the asset you hold also goes to zero. And so, from a legal point of view, obviously we are doing everything that this is not a security. You know, the Howey test, all the Howey tests, we scored it. Right? Obviously. We don't want to be a security. But I think just like practically and philosophically, these things are not securities. You know, to the earlier question, if demand goes away, the value goes away. Um, you don't, you don't own a piece of any entity, you own a piece of an asset. So, we, we don't think they're securities. Hey Ted, so super cool vision and more so I love the courage that you're actually taking this step forward. Um, so two quick questions. So first, um, how are you making it mainstream within Kick? Are you giving everyone Kick points? Are you converting Kick points to Kick points? Like, what's your play um, there? So we're going to take the kick points playbook and run a very similar thing with Kim, you know, where we give some out to get the economy going and we build a bunch of two-sided marketplaces where you can earn and spend and we let the market determine the prices. And um, kick points stay there or? So we're going to shut down kick points and we're going to relaunch Kim. The big challenge though for Kim is like, the tr like if we had the transaction volume of kick points, the Ethereum network would go down and we'd never come back up. Um, so we, we need to roll it in slowly. And so it will be a slow rollout. You know, you think of like sort of like the way Gmail rolled it on the internet, um, sort of user by user. Uh, we will do something pretty similar. So it will take time to get to this full vision of any developer, any user, and any service anywhere in the world. Um, but we're going to try to get there as fast as technologically possible. Anybody who's working on more scalable blockchains, you know, that's what we're looking for help with. And then second question. So the very long term, that they can is super successful. Does Kick become a holding company of Kin Coins essentially, or is is like Kin Foundation a five hundred one c three? Like, is it not like where does it lie on like, the balance sheet? Like, where is this asset? Uh, so thirty percent lies on Kick's balance sheet, and my dream is like one day we just walk away. <laughs> like, you know, we take take thirty percent of Kin, we distribute it to shareholders because at this point the ecosystem doesn't need us. So like Kick as a service in the ecosystem, maybe we spin that out, we continue to build that, maybe we sell it, I don't know. But like us, the ultimate dream is for Kick to launch Kin, to launch this broader ecosystem, but then for this broader ecosystem to not be Kick. And that's what like, you know, you look at like Satoshi, right? 
That guy like created something and then walked away and it just keeps going. And so we're not gonna walk away. You know, we wanna make sure it's gonna go all the way. Uh, but at some point we love the idea that we, you know, it could be so successful, so decentralized, so autonomous that like our participation becomes irrelevant. So you just want a vacation, right? <laughs> I'm tired of it. Too. <laughs> no, I'm just, I, you know, building a company is hard, right? I, I've been building Kick for eight and a half years. I started when I was 22. I just turned 30 um, in April. And my younger brother, who is like, hey, so I guess you're officially a middle-aged entrepreneur. And I was like, yeah, you can't say that. <laughs> you're no longer a young entrepreneur. I'm still young. Um, building a company is hard. And like, you know, like for me, this is not like, about building a profile or having power or anything like that. I just like to build cool stuff with cool people. And so, you know, there's other things I want to build one day. And so the idea that if Kick could get to a place where it does the world a lot of good and a lot of people make a lot of money and I can go build the next thing, like, that'd be really cool. So my question is regarding the ICO. Um, let's say it's as successful as some of the recent ICOs and you raised 50 million dollars worth of ether. What, what will you guys do with that ether? So we will convert it to US dollars. Um, so is that what your question is? Or how are we gonna use the funds? Well, how are you gonna use the funds? Because most, most other ICOs are using those funds to build another platform. You yeah. guys already have a platform. So, so we're gonna use the funds to build a platform. Uh, so to build it, the transaction service, the identity service, the reward engine, to build it all the use cases inside of Kick, to get a bunch of developers building use cases outside of Kick, um, basically to like launch this whole broader ecosystem. Because it's, it's sort of double dipping because you're taking that yeah, and your 30% both. Yeah, so I guess are you saying you're sort of taking 40%. Well, I don't know. So, so maybe this is like the allocation is we're selling 10%, so we're creating 10 trillion Kin tokens. You know, why a trillion? It's because consumers, when they host a group chat, do not want to earn 0 0.0002 Bitcoin. They'd rather earn two kin. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we just always look at this through a consumer lens. So that's why so many. Uh, we're going to take one trillion of those tokens and sell it in a you know token distribution event, and we're going to do half pre-sale to institutional investors, which is already completely spoken for and more. Yeah. We're coming people back, and then half through a. Uh, public distribution event. And that distribution event, we think we have some cool ideas to how on the one side not be greedy, like cap it at what we think is like a reasonable amount, but on the other side make it fair so that the people who want to participate can. Um, so that will be the first one trillion tokens. Three trillion tokens will go to kick. That will be on investing schedule, 10% per quarter for 10 quarters. And uh, the remaining six trillion tokens will go to the foundation. Um, and that will be used to grow the ecosystem, to pay the developers, uh, to run all the infrastructure and get everything going. Hi, billion, man, billion dollar asset, right? We're rolling it in, that's like the exciting thing is, you know, can you build a community this big without a lot of investment? No. And so that's, you know, I gotta convince my investors and, and convince myself that. How long before you sell it? How long before you sell it? That? How long before we sell it? That? How long before we sell it? The 30%? No, the ICO. Sorry? The ICO How long, like time-wise, till we sell it out? Like, is it gonna happen in like three minutes? So we think we have a very clever way of doing it where that will not be an issue. We could be wrong. I don't think we are wrong. We'll see. Anyways, we talk to people in this space, like, you know, Polychain, Blockchain, all these guys. And Polychain is talking to them and explaining to them how we're gonna do the public side. They go, wow, that's exactly the right way. You guys came up with first, that's so smart. That way it's like both not greedy and fair. That's awesome. Congratulations, guys. Awesome. Uh, so like we, I can't, I'm not gonna announce it yet because I gotta make sure, we gotta make sure it's gonna work. Uh, but you know, I think like a kick, we always, what are all the options? How can we do this in a way that benefits most people, it's the most fair, it's like win, win, win. Hi, Ted. Uh, I understand that the Kin Foundation is separate. I was curious if uh, you anticipate any effects during uh, a change of control, a liquidity event, or an IPO for Kick, and how that would correlate or anything. So, what interest. would happen if Kick sold or Kick IPO'd? Or is that the question? Yeah. Change of control. So. so. <laughs> How to answer this question. 
So we really want this to work, and I really want this to work. And at the end of the day, I was very fortunate. I still control the vote of the shares at Kick, and I still control the majority of the seats at Kick. So I think, like at the end of the day, if we were to do something different, it would have to be because I decided. It's really scary for me, actually. I don't like that. Um, but what it does mean is that, you know, I'm committed to this, and I really want to do this. And the reason we got excited about this in 2011 is selling sucks because you know somebody takes it and does whatever they want with it. Going public sucks because you get on this treadmill where you, you need to squeeze more and more revenue out of these people, and you're on this never-ending treadmill, there has to be another way. And the reason we gotta save it is this is the third way. You, know, you build an economy, you get everybody transacting in cryptocurrency, you own some of that cryptocurrency, and then you can walk away. Not that because you wanna walk away, but because you could. And so I think for us, it's like, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, right? I don't know if there's gonna be some crazy hostile takeover, or you know, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know as of right now, like, I'm very committed to this. We are very committed to this. All of our investors are on board. All of our team is on board. People are really excited about it, internally. And so we're gonna go for it. Um, so that's, that's the best I can do. So looking at the time, I think it's be the last question, uh, but maybe Ted will stick around after. People can mill around, talk. We always have more beer as well. Here we go. Thanks, Ted. Uh, great talk. Your heart's really in the right place. It's good to see. Uh, what would you say to a cynic that would say, 30% uh, of these tokens are going to kick. You said 60% goes to the foundation, then 10% left, 5% goes to investors, and 5% goes to this crowd sale. Um, the 5% that's raised in the crowd sale, is that just setting what the rest of these tokens that are just issued to all these parties are worth? So we are going to do like a capped raise. But if whatever the cap of that 5% is, say if it's $40 million, right? That's $40 million that exists in the world that is 5% of this other 95% that you've just made up. Uh, what, what do you say to a cynic that says you've just created all this money by taking the public's funds in this hyped event, you know, right, right at peak hype with all this blockchain stuff? You know, what, what do you say to that person? So, I think, like for me, um, I think this is like the dark off, for better and for worse. You know, there is a lot of hype right now, and people are gonna make a lot of money, people have made a lot of money. People are gonna lose a lot of money here. This is coming, right? And it's gonna happen multiple times as we move through this innovation. But at the end of the day, Amazon and Google came out of the dark off. And so this is how I view, like, uh, tokens and ICOs, I think 90% of them probably are going to go to zero. And people are going to lose a lot of money. And you know, the regulators are going to come in, they're going to say, how do we make this lab for innovation, but still make it safe for consumers, and everybody's going to be trying to figure this out, and it's going to be crazy. It's going to be, I was in like high school at the time, but I think like 2001, 2000 or 2001, whatever year it was, it's going to be that all over again. But I think for us, it's, we believe that, you know, a few huge economic entities are gonna come out of this space. And I think actually a few huge economic entities have already come out of this space. And so I think, you know, it's like everything, it's risk and reward. Um, but I think, you know, we have a good story, I think we're trying to do it in a fair way, and I think our heart's in the right place, and we're gonna do everything we can. You know, what really scares me at the end of the day is disappointing people. And I think what scares me about doing a crowd sale is before, if Kick failed, I would disappoint a bunch of rich people. But now, if Kick fails, I will disappoint a bunch of regular people. And that like really weighs on us and really weighs on me. Um, so we're gonna do everything we can to, to make it a win for everybody. All right, well that was a great talk. Let's all thank that. Thanks so much. We have lots of beer over here, so check it out. Thanks so much.